Hello and welcome along to episode four of the Bunny Hop, proudly powered by Cannondale, coming up this month. Our pundits react to the eighth and final edition of La Course. Hayley Simmons talks about her journey from boat to bike as we take a spin around the lanes of Cambridge. We dive into the mind of Katia Nivadoma in Something About Me. And we discuss what next year's race calendar might conjure up with the new Tour de France farm. Well, it's great to be back here in the Bunny Hut studio once again. And alongside me today is former Team Time Trial World Champion and someone that's named her hair Tracy, Katie Colclough. And alongside Katie and Tracy today is journalist and owner of a dog fan Instagram account, Amy Jones. Welcome both. <laughs> My intros are just getting more and more ridiculous by the month, but I absolutely love it. Is it true? Because one of our mutual friends says you've named your hair. Is it accurate? I would, I would like to say that it wasn't self-entitled. It was a, a friend. It was actually Annie Lass, the mountain biker, who first named Tracy after Tracy Beaker. Quite an unruly, unruly <laughs> oh. child. And since then, it has stuck. And Amy, I have seen that you've put on your Instagram bio dog fan account, but there's a sizable amount of that cycling as well. Yeah, it's just my own Instagram account, but I happen to be a huge fan of dogs. So lots of dog pics on there. So it just seems like a dog fan account, but it's actually just my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it. Well, let's get straight into the racing with the course that took place on an undulating route, starting in Brest and heading to the finishing circuit in Lanzano. We join the action now just as the two-up breakaway comprising Sadrine Cabal and Eleanor Peroni was reeled in with 42k to go. Peroni managed to jump into a new escape formed of 12 riders as the race headed over the Cote de la Fossa Lou for the first of four ascents. Second time round the circuit and it was a stinging attack from SD Works and Havana Bregan that brought the chasing peloton up to the leading group, creating a launch pad for a new dozen rider breakaway. With the majority of the top teams represented, it looked as if the new escape might stay away. But with FDJ's Avita Music trying to bridge, and behind her a concerted effort from Mariana Voss's Jumbo Visma, the move didn't last. Van Bregen turned on the afterburners up the final climb, chased by Voss, with the world champion's teammate, young pretender Demi Vollering, poised to pounce. And that she did, snatching her second Women's World Tour win of the season. Cecilia Trip Ludwig was second and Voss third. Amy, this edition of La Course did not disappoint, did it? In particular with that finale. Yeah, I mean, La Course, for all the flack that it gets, is usually a really exciting race. Um, I mean, we saw it last year in Nice with um, Lizzie Dignan beating Marina Voss. And this year, it was almost similar tactics from SD Works that Trek used um, to beat Marina Voss again with Demi Vollering. Um, yeah, it was a great race. What I thought was really interesting was the tactics between Anna van der Breggen and Demi Vollering, and I've really enjoyed watching them throughout the early season classics. And I think Vollering had, she had the legs to finish it off, didn't she? When you watch the overhead shot, you see how powerful her sprint is at the end. So yeah, I think she's just growing and growing in confidence. And that's something that we don't always fully appreciate when you're watching the end of a bike race, is it? Until you see that aerial shot, just how much of a gap somebody's actually got. Yeah, Demi Vollering's been caught out with that one before in uh, Brabant's Appeal with Ruth Window where she celebrated too early. So even on the ground, I think um, you can't really tell, but the aerial shot just showed she had it. She even, um, she got boxed in at one point. I think Voss switched a bit. And so she came really strong from quite far back to take that win. And Voss didn't have it all her way. Yeah, it seems she did what it's become a little bit the classic Ross move and it. she did lead it out very long and I don't know whether that was just because the opportunity was there or not but I think it, it further played into the hands of SD Works and Demi Vollering. And another big attack we saw Amy was from Canyon Shrouds, Tiff Cromwell. Yeah, at the bottom of the final climb she put in a huge dig for Cassia Nuodoma to set her up really well to get into that um, select group at the finish. I mean, it's interesting the switch roles almost with Trek and Canyon Shrouds there because Trek have been known for their really good tactics throughout the season and last season and Canyon have sometimes missed a trick or two every now and again whereas in this race I think they played it really well they've got Michaela Harvey, Elise Chabé who we can't recognize anymore now she's not in a Swiss national champs jersey um, and yeah they they played a really good race um, it's a shame that Cassia found herself in that group with lots of fast finishes because she could have done better if she'd been able to go solo I think 
she's not got the fastest finish, but um, yeah, that was a really good effort from Tiffany Cromwell. It's great to see her back in, in her, at her best, really. What did you make of that finish and, and the dynamic of it as a whole, though? I mean, all the names up there. All of them, with the exception of Lizzie Dignan, she went into it as the favourite, as the defending champion, but um, just didn't have the legs to finish it off. And her team did a pretty good job throughout the race. They got two riders in, in the breaks. They got Lucinda Brand and Ruth Winder. But I think she said herself after the race that she just didn't have it on the day. Interesting to see how she'll go in the next few races, actually. And what did you make of how Trek played it as a team? Yeah, it's a difficult one. Um, Trek is quite a similar lineup to when I raced as specialised with Lululemon. They've got um, on the team roster Ella Van Dyke, Tripsy Warwick, um, Ina Yoko Teutenberg is one of the DSs. Um, so for me, it's like a very familiar lineup, which I think they've, they've got a lot of wisdom in. I think a lot of those riders have all been going through the Olympic selection campaign, which I think will probably have a waiting on some of their, not necessarily the tactics, but the training phases that they're in at the moment. And also maybe a little bit of like, what's Lizzie's phase going on now? Is it that she's in a heavy training phase and that's why she didn't have the legs? Or is she maybe just not wanting to show quite what she's got right now? It's, it's really hard to say. And I think she's a very kind of self-assured and very experienced rider. Yeah, you never know, like riders when before races, they'll say one thing. A recent example that I can think of is Anna van der Breggen ahead of Flesh Wallon. Um, she was obviously being asked by everybody, like, are you going to win it for a seventh time? Um, and she'd said she'd been a bit ill and they might be racing for Demi. And then, of course, in the end, she did win the seventh, uh, the seventh edition. Well, time to take a quick break from the race action because next up, it's our postcard feature. And this month, the bunny hop headed to Cambridge to catch up with Cam's Basso's Hayley Simmons and find out how she made the switch from paddling to pedalling. There are not that many hills at all. <laughs> I have not seen you in so long. I have know. you? Been? Yeah, really good, thanks. Yeah, it's nice to have you uh, have you here in Cambridge. Well, I was going to say this is not a bad backdrop for today's bike ride. No. How did you end up here in Cambridge? It was always kind of a dream from when I was at school that I could come and do a degree in in Cambridge. And so I started studying here 2006 and was here until 2016 I graduated, so 10 years, so a long time. <laughs> so you enjoyed the studying then? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Three degrees later, undergrad, a master's and a PhD, and then I became a full-time cyclist, so, yeah. <laughs> well, happily, we stole you away from rowing to cycling. Yeah. Talking of which, <laughs> should we go for a pedal? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> This is quite cool because this is one of the crews from um, from Keys Boat Club, and uh, yeah, so Keys is the college I was at when I did my PhD. But I was I was already a cyclist by the time I was doing my PhD, so I never really did any rowing with Keys. But uh, yeah, that's one of the crews from Keys. There must be a lot of memories in this spot, particularly. Yeah, it feels like a lifetime ago. I mean. Yeah, sometimes when it's nice weather and I cycle past the river, I think it would be nice to just go out in a single skull and have a nice leisurely paddle up and down the river. But uh, <laughs> I think I'm too competitive for leisurely sports. <laughs> so when you got into rowing, what was the end goal? I got into it at school. And so when I found out I was coming to Cambridge, it became quite a big goal for me to row in the university boat race because everybody knows the Oxford Cambridge boat race. So Massive. yeah, you know, and being pretty competitive, I wanted to row in a boat race, and then uh, obviously I wanted to win the boat race. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm glad my crew did win our race because I feel like if we hadn't won, I would have felt like I'd got unfinished business. So why did you then ultimately move from rowing into cycling? How did that happen? As much as I loved rowing, it, it's quite a difficult sport, especially at university level. Every morning I would get a train to Ely at 5.55 a.m. We do. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm no longer a morning person. I did it for so long. Um, then I'd have evening training, and then we had double sessions at weekends as well. So actually it was pretty, pretty time consuming. 
I got pretty tired in my third year, so fourth year I just wanted to concentrate on, on my exams. And then after my exams in fourth year, I kind of thought, oh, I'd like to get back into some sport again, do something. So uh, my boyfriend at the time, now husband, said, why don't you try cycling? You know, he'd been a cyclist since his teens. So he lent me one of his old racing frames and he took me out for, you know, an hour's ride. So, you know, competitive nature took over. Yeah. <laughs> Mark probably regrets he ever got me into it because I uh, cost him a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of driving around the world, but, you know. And give him a hard time give up him... the hills now. <laughs> Poor Mark. You must be the leanest you've been since I've known you at the moment. I think it must have been quite soon after you'd come from rowing. Yeah. Um, and you said to me that you'd actually lost quite a dramatic amount before you got on the bike. Sounds really stupid. I, I kind of got up to like 100 odd kilos without really noticing almost. It, it just sort of like happens gradually and you don't notice. And then suddenly it seems like, oh, sh you know, I've got I've got all of this now that I need to lose. But it is doable. You know, now um, the, the weight that I am at the moment is around about 56. I've tried to do it healthily with the support of a nutritionist. Is it quite mad to think though that's half the weight? Mate, I was about to wing. say it's, it's pretty much 50%, isn't it? So yeah, which is, which is quite crazy. And it's brilliant that you talk about it. And I think you've always been quite open and honest in that respect. You've shared quite a lot of what you're working on behind the scenes. Yeah, you know, I've, I, I have struggled with my weight. I still struggle with my weight. I can't just go and, you know, eat what I want and because I am prone to putting on weight quite easily. But I, I don't see any point kind of hiding it and hiding the struggles. Yeah, so there's a really nice place to stop for a coffee up here, actually. <laughs> Never say no to coffee. So over the last few years, how much has the possibility of Tokyo Selection been a focus? Yeah, I mean, since I was a child, I've always loved watching the Olympics. And so obviously becoming a professional sports person, the Olympics has always been a dream. I was pretty gutted in 2016 because I won the national time trial on the Thursday and then effectively found out on the Friday that I hadn't been selected for Rio. So that was a pretty emotional week. Um, and then to be honest, um, things went a little bit pear-shaped from pretty soon after the Commonwealth Games in, in 2018. Um, I broke my elbow, um, my father-in-law passed away. So I suppose in a way I'm a bit sad, obviously to have missed Tokyo selection, knowing that I'm currently on that really good form. Um, but, you know, I, I can carry on going for another three years to Paris. You're very philosophical when you talk about your setbacks like that, but how do you, in reality, stop yourself from going, if I hadn't broken my elbow, if I hadn't had that crash, maybe I'd be here, maybe I'd be selected. There have been quite a few times over the last 18 months, two years, where I thought, should I, should I stop now? Should I look for a, a job? Should I, you know, should I keep going? Um, and I think if I stopped now, I'd, I'd always wonder what if, um, and I'd have regrets. You know, it's a year till Birmingham Commonwealth Games and only three years to Paris. So having Birmingham a year away as, as a major focus is just, is really exciting for me. And I truly believe that I can get a gold medal in, in that time trial next year. Um, and that, that's really exciting for me. So that, that's gotta be the aim. And I have spied that you're a bit nifty at baking cakes. Yeah, I, uh, I've been called a feeder many times by Mark and by other friends, but uh, yeah, I made one of Mark and my wedding cakes. I made a, a nut-free one for a family with nut allergies. I made my brother's wedding cake in January 2020 in New Zealand. And I guess the baking's probably quite a nice way to actually switch off. Yeah, it's kind of what I do to relax a little bit. Um, you know, I, it kind of fits with having a science PhD as well. It's a bit like chemistry. So 
I love doing it. Um, I love trying new things and, and yeah, and then I kind of like getting the feedback. Hayley, thank you for such an enjoyable chat along the way today and showing me these beautiful roads. Oh, it's really nice to be able to share some of my kind of home training roads with you and the sun came out, which is really nice. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's been really nice to spend some time with you again. It's been lovely. And yeah, the sun coming out was the icing on the cake. As ever, we can't wait to see you out there racing and good luck with it all. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it's important to know that Hayley lost all that weight with close support from a network of people, including, of course, medical experts, nutritionists, and that is really crucial, isn't it? Yeah, it's something I feel very, I guess, strongly about because I think it's easy to look at these things from the outside and these people become role models and idols for young people getting into the sport. And this is something that's maybe not sustainable for a long period of time to be that lean. There are lots of other effects that this can have on somebody. And I think like bone density is something that is something that's very important to me and I think that people have not considered. So for example, I have osteopenia and that's probably a result of overtraining and being performing in a, what is a power to weight sport. Um, and I guess it's almost a little bit taboo. Like I will say, I didn't have periods for a lot of my career and that's probably why I have low bone density now. Um, and a lot of that, if you aren't heavy enough and you don't have enough weight, you're not letting yourself function as a normal woman. And I think that it's really important that these riders have access to that support and they're doing this safely and in a controlled manner as opposed to just reducing food intake. So um, it's good, it's positive, we want to get the best out of ourselves, but I think we have to be very careful and make sure that we're promoting this in the right way. Well, it's been something of a breakthrough season for the ever charismatic Cecily Utrecht Ludwig with a string of recent podium positions. Amy, what do you think's made the biggest difference? She seems to have more confidence this season. Um, she's got a great team with FDJ. Uh, they have confidence in her. They signed her for a further two years on her contract before she'd even done a single race for the team. Um, and I think you know, after winning her first World Tour race in Burgos on stage three, um, you could already see the extra confidence that she had in La Course. To come second and beat Marina Vos, like, that's an incredible result for a rider like Silo. Like Amy said here, I think it's really nice to see that the teams are signing these riders up for longer. I think there was always, when I was riding, there was a lot of one-year contracts, and I, for one, was on one-year contracts, and not that that's anyone's fault, but it definitely leaves you with a feeling of uncertainty, and every race matters then, particularly after kind of mid-season, you're thinking, crikey, I need to get something, like, I need to show myself just to have a living next year and have something sorted, so I think that... It gives riders that opportunity to build over longer periods of time, put in long-term training plans and work on all those weaknesses and not kind of short-term, just looking at the next target. And I'd say that probably has really helped her as a rider. She'll take some risks and she does some different moves and there she's got that kick at the end of a race as well. And I think that's something that if you don't have the kick, it's, it's quite a hard one to train. You can get strong, you can train the engine, but that real kind of kick at the end is, yeah, that's pretty special. And I think actually, Amy, we've often seen really gutsy moves from her all along since we first saw her in the peloton, but it's really paying off with those podium places now. And it's in part to the team around her. Yeah, they've really stepped it up in the last couple of seasons. Um, FDJ, we have Evita Music on the team now who won a stage, the final stage of the Giro Rosa last year. Um, she recently won the French national championships as well. And she's only, I think, 22 years old. Um, and it's great to see Amelia Farling coming back too. She's had a couple of seasons where she's had some uh, injuries. I think she had a concussion. So it's great to see her at the front of the races as well. And she's also got a great right-hand woman in Brody Chapman, who's always up there on the climbs for her. So I think she's got the confidence and she's got the backing as well from her teammates. And we can't forget Marta Cavalli as well, who's going really well um, for her own results too. So yeah, it's a good team they've got going on there now. And Katie, how well do you know the riders in that makeup of FDJ at the moment? Yeah, Amelia Farn is someone who I was good friends with. We lived together as athletes. Um, so it's really nice for me to see that she's doing well. And she's consistently been up there quite a lot. And I wonder whether she's someone that's maybe not quite got the confidence yet to really make that move and take a risk. It seems like she seems to be always around there, but she's not quite getting on the podium yet. So I obviously, from a biased interest, would really like that to, <laughs> to happen for her.
Well, having a full race schedule back this season is more appreciated than ever, I think, among both the peloton and the fans alike. But it's all set to step up even further for 2022, in particular with a very long-awaited addition to the UCI calendar, of course, the Tour de France fam. Amy, this is big news. It is, and long-awaited indeed. It's been however many years now, seven, eight, since the first edition of La Course, which was supposed to kind of lead into it. Um, but better late than never. Um, and I think a lot, all the riders are really excited about it as much as I think many people would wish that women's cycling didn't have to rely on the Tour de France brand or follow in the men's footsteps. It's a fact that the Tour de France is something that transcends cycling. Like if you ask a random person on the street, they'll know what the Tour de France is. So, and a lot of the riders have said, they get asked by people, oh, you're a cyclist, do you race the Tour de France? And now they can say, yes, we do. So. And Katie, what, what's your uh, impressions of having a look at where it's going to sit on the calendar and, and uh, the structure of it? Yeah I, think, yeah, I think it can only be a good, good thing to have it. And I think it's obviously coming straight after uh, the Men's Tour de France, which I think is good that it's not alongside it. I think it needs to be at a separate time. Um, and I think it will. I think it will hold that momentum afterwards. It's a busy time of year for sport, isn't it? We have Wimbledon and then the Tour de France, and I'm always a bit sad when everything finishes like that. So it'll be like, yay, we've now got a women's one to keep <laughs> us going. Um, so I think, yeah, I think overall it is, it's a positive step for sure. It is, and I think it's really good that it's going to come as a standalone after the men's tour. Yeah, I mean, we saw with La Course the other day, it started so early. Um, you can't expect people to stand outside on the road all day long watching the women's race and then the men's race. And obviously, with people working the race too, like, it just makes it logistically very difficult. So you can understand the argument for that. Um, the question is, I suppose, is whether people will still have an appetite after three weeks of the men's race to follow the women straight after. But... I think given that they're doing almost like a relay on the Champs-Élysées where the men's race finishes and the women's race starts, um, hopefully that gets people interested in the women's race. Yeah, it's not just the Tour de France we're looking at next year, is it? There's plenty of stage racing. Yeah, after a few months where we've had kind of a lack of stage racing for the women, it's great to see next year the return of some stage races that weren't on the calendar this year. Um, or we're supposed to be like the Itzulia Basque country race. Um, and then there's the Battle of the North, that's I think been long anticipated. It's supposed to come in 2019. So that's going to be another six day stage race. Um, hopefully we'll see the Giro Rosa return to world tour level two because um, they were demoted for not providing live coverage. So hopefully they do that. And um, obviously the women's tour as well is always popular with riders and fans. Um, so yeah, it's great to see more opportunities for women to race over multiple days. Next stop, we explore all that is weird and wonderful about the minds of the pro peloton in Something About Me. And this month, it's the turn of Canyon Shrams, Katia Nuvodoma. I have an unreasonable fear of snakes. Oh my goodness, I cannot stand snakes. They freak me out. I fell in love with cycling when I finished the race being very tired, when I was like destroyed but satisfied at the same time. The thing I miss most when I'm away from home is Polish white cheese called Tvarożek, which is extremely delicious and you can eat it in a sweet way or savory way and it's so unfortunate that you cannot buy it anywhere else. The thing some people do that I don't get is posting a fake life on Instagram. I love learning more about psychology or human psychology. Weirdest thing I won at the bike race was sausage. Like, actually not a sausage, a giant basket of different sausages. <laughs> the best smell in the world is the smell of the mountain air especially at night. My signature dance moves involves jumping, definitely a lot of jumping. The most annoying thing people say to me is, uh, when are we gonna beat all those statues? The thing I do first when I get home after a race is put a nice makeup on, a nice dress and go to see my chicas in town. My go-to drink is, depending on the season, uh, vermouth in the winter time and gin tonic in the summertime. 
My favorite photo is of my siblings and myself back in the days when we were like very young. The last thing I ate was burger actually. <laughs> very good burger. One thing that they should bring back from the past is get disco parties maybe. Well, I've always wondered what goes on inside Cash's mind, and now we know. Well, that's almost all we've got time for from this episode of The Bunny Heart. But before we go, as ever, we threw this week's pundit question wide open over on social media. And thanks to Dan Hall on Instagram for this question for our studio guests. And that is, what would be your dream cycling destination, Katie? Oh, that's a tricky one, that is. Um, I found in recent years, I like to go to places with like, somewhere I can do a bit of a tour. I like riding like point to point or something. Mm. I don't like to just go out for a ride for the sake of it. <laughs> so I really enjoyed going to Bordeaux recently because I could do a tour of vineyards and I love cheese. I've been wanting to go to Scotland and do a distillery tour, but the problem is the weather, isn't it? I'm not, I'm a fair weather rider now. So my dream destination would be Scotland, whiskey dis distillery tour, but the weather of Southern Spain all, all combined in one. No problem. Just mm -hmm. combine it all. Yeah. Perfect destination, Amy. Boozy one, that's a great shout. Mm. <laughs> I was thinking Slovenia, just because there's so many great cyclists that have come out of that country in recent years, and I want to know what all the fuss is about. Love it. Amy, Katie, thank you so much for all your insight today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, that really is all we've got time for from this episode of The Bunny Hop. We'll be back again next month. But in the meantime, don't be a stranger, be a bunny hopper. Give us a follow over on social media using the handle at the bunny hop underscore CC. We'll see you next time. And well, keep riding, keep watching and keep bunny hopping. Bye for now.